All right, new much. Um, let's uh, take our seats, please, and get the meeting started. It's 4 o'clock. Thank you to everyone so much for being here. This is the October meeting of the Point Loma Ocean Beach Democratic Club. We have um, a really great presentation today, and want to say thank you to our e-board members who helped us uh, get ready with this lovely snap plate, and thank you to all of you for being here. My name is Kit Meichen. I'm the president of the club. Um, and before we get started, um, I will uh, ask if we can approve the agenda. The agenda was sent out in the uh, email to remind about today's meeting. Could I get a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Mandy. Any seconds? Here. Okay, thank you so much. And um, I will say, is there any opposition to approving today's agenda? Then it's approved and we'll get started. Um, so our main uh, presentation today is by Art Castanares, and before he comes up to present, I want to bring up Laurie Saldana to introduce um, him before his presentation. Hi, Laurie. Um, after his presentation, we will do some question and answer because we're recording this meeting. I want to make it clear that this meeting is being recorded. Um, we're going to use a microphone for the people asking questions. Um, so please just raise your hand and I'll scurry around and give you the microphone when it's your turn. So without further ado, Lori. Good afternoon and uh, thank you all for coming out for the, the regular monthly meeting and also especially to hear our, our presenter today. Um, Art was the youngest Central Committee Chair for the San Diego County Democratic Party. Uh, 25 years ago. We were doing the math the other day. Uh, I was a member of the Central Committee at the time. He was just transitioning out, and but we met each other a few years later. He maintained his involvement with local politics, and actually I had, through a longer story I won't get into, the campaign manager for my assembly campaign in 2004 was not able to continue, and Art and former state senator, um, Oh my goodness, my brain is from blank. Steve Peace, I was going to say Steve Christman, wrong Steve. Uh, Steve Peace were assigned to be with me, and I saw this young man, and this was a, a very expensive campaign, and I basically told the uh, organizers of that meeting, do you really want to turn a million dollar, at that time a lot of money, a million dollar campaign over to this youngster? And, and uh, Art was not at all offended. <laughs> I think he was used, he was accustomed to people underestimating him, including today, the Union Tribune, and uh, the Mayor of San Diego, and many others, because he is consistently now uh, reporting on issues about 101 Ash Street, uh, other political issues that have not been covered well in other local media. So he graduated from UCSD, he's a lifelong San Diego resident, and has a very keen perspective on what is happening politically in San Diego. He knows not only where uh, the bodies are buried, but he has the uh, unique ability <laughs> to get the living bodies to talk about that. Oh, careful. Um, so, so we really are in for um, an interesting discussion of things that are uh, affecting the Democratic Party right now. And I, I really have appreciated his perspective through the challenges that um, the party is facing when it comes to finances, endorsements, um, other issues. I think that's my phone, I'll turn it off. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I encourage you to listen carefully because this really does impact the future of this club in ways that I'll discuss later on in the meeting. And, with no further ado, we're very fortunate to have as our speaker today, our Castaneras publisher of La Prensa San Diego. Thank you. This is really nice to be here. I haven't done a club meeting in a long, long time. I was chair 25 years ago. So I just put this up at the Senate of John just so people would know why I talk about the party or why I may have a different view. So just a quick synopsis, I'm the owner and publisher of La Prensa San Diego. We're now in our 46th year. It was 39 years old when I bought it. Um, we're, we're going in now past eight years. So um, 
it, it's, a, it's a bilingual paper. We just published a story today that's bilingual. Uh, we have several reporters that are bilingual, and uh, we have a lot of freelancers that, that contribute to us. Uh, before this, this is like my third, my third career I've had, but before this, I, uh, I was a legislative staffer. I started when I was 17 years old. I was in high school. And so 1989, from 1989 to 93, I worked for the Assembly. And then got member, got elected to the Senate. I worked for the Senate. From 93 to 2002, I ended up being, I went from being the intern to the chief of staff to the same member. So I passed everybody in the office. It was a very strange experience. So I was with the Sacramento the last four years. I worked on the state budget. Um, I left that in 2002 when he was turned out. So I've now been out longer than I was ever in. So I consider myself a recovering political staffer. Uh, but during that time, I also did other things. I was the chair of the party uh, from 98 to 2001. I was a national delegate to the convention in LA in 2000. Uh, I worked for the White House for about a year. I used to travel with Al Gore all over the country. Uh, doing advanced work, so it was an incredible experience to do that. Um, uh, before I was chair, I was the director of political action for the Central Committee, on the Central Committee, uh, a bunch of state conventions, a couple of people like Steve Rivera and I used to go to the state conventions when we were much younger. And so people always ask me how many campaigns I've been involved in, and I always count them as what I call uh, election night decisions, because sometimes it's a primary and a general or special elections. So in campaigns that I've been directly involved in, I've had 74 election night decisions. And four of those lost. Four out of seven. So it's been, a, it's been a lot of campaign. Lori and I went through the campaign in her 04 campaign. That was no 04, right? So it's been almost 20 years since I worked on that campaign with Lori. Um, so I, I was always the young guy in the room on that that isn't the case anymore, sort of weird. My doctor, my doctor's younger than me, that's it. That was a shock. And that first started that me, right? So, uh, so that's just from my background, so you have that. Uh, if you haven't already been to La Prensa, our domain is laprensa.org. Like I say, established in 1976. I'm only the third publisher. And the original founder, uh, Dan Munoz, was a very interesting man. Um, I, I was a big fan of his. He was a Korea War veteran. Um, was a Chicago Studies professor, founded the paper, it was the first Latino outlet in San Diego. And then he passed away in 93, his son ran it until 2015 when I took it over. And he didn't want to sell it to anybody else. And if I didn't buy it, they were going to close it down. So really I bought it to save La Prensa. I never even feel like it's mine. I feel like I'm a caretaker of this community paper. And when I decide I no longer can do this, so hopefully it'll be someone else to pass it on to. Um, that's our website, we're on social media. <clears throat> that's my email address if you ever want to contact me uh, directly. So, I, I just want to talk about some of the stuff that's going on. We write about a lot of things, not just politics, but uh, because of my background, I do focus more on some of these stories that, to me, I just need to have more insight into it because I used to be on the other side. I was a staffer at a very high level, um, dealing with some incredible political things that were behind the scenes that most people will never get to see. And so when I see things happening in real time, it, it looks different to me. I haven't been there, right? I, I, I understand it differently. And I also have a lot of relationships with people that are insiders and staffers and city departments or wherever it is. And they see things and they're just afraid to speak up because they don't want to risk their careers. And so they reach out to some journalists that they trust. And more and more, they, they come to me. And sometimes now I get anonymous tips because people have seen what I write. And I, I got a letter a couple weeks ago, it was a blank, white letter, printed, addressed to me, and the first sentence was, I send this to you because you seem to be the only journalist willing to write this kind of stuff. And it was an insider inside of the city, gave me some tips that I would have never known. I, you know, I, I can't see, I'm not everywhere to see these things. And so that was a, a really good tip. We haven't published that story yet, but it's a, it's a very inside story you know, about some things going on inside the city. So. Not only is the relationship I have that over 34 years I've been doing this, but now and more and more it's just people who follow what we write. Uh, so it's really interesting. La Prensa used to be a small community paper focused inward to the Latino community. And since we've expanded it, there are people like you guys reading this, this wasn't our audience before, right? So La Prensa has really broadened our, uh, our reach because of the kinds of stories that we write. So I appreciate that. It's always weird. To, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie when, Hall when, when Harry met Sally. 
And there's a, the guy's on a date and the woman quotes an article that he wrote. And he says, I wrote that. And he says, I've never had somebody quote me back to me. And that happens to me sometimes. It's the weirdest feeling ever. It was something that was in my head that I wrote down that I sent out. And when we put it out there, we don't know how many people read this stuff, right? I know. I have no idea. And so when I run into people that say, I've read your story, it's, it's still a weird feeling for me. Um, you wouldn't believe that I'm actually an introvert. So it's still weird for me to be killed this kind of stuff. So I encourage you, if you don't follow our stuff, this was the other day we had new stories that were posted since then. But the story that was the top story that day was about something going on at the Port of San Diego. And they censured one of their commissioners. First time ever that the port has, has done that. And I didn't know her, I met her once before this happened. But I wrote a story because I had an insider telling me there's more to it. And so I wrote a, a pretty harsh opinion piece about the process. So if you haven't read that story, that's interesting too. Um, we got a lot of traction over the last three years on the 101 Ash story downtown. It's still going on, the city is about $200 million into a building that is probably worth zero today. And it's a big scandal, it isn't over yet. Uh, but we had insiders and whistleblowers come to us. So we broke a lot of stories on that. And I took a lot of criticism. I, I wrote the first piece that the broker for the city made money. Nobody had said that. And I got that from an insider. And we tried to reach him and the, the broker wouldn't respond. So we published a story saying that he made millions of dollars. And he didn't deny it, he wouldn't say anything. I got criticized by other reporters who would call me and say, none of our sources have confirmed that. Where'd you get this? I said, well, you got to get better sources. I don't know what to do. Exactly. I, don't, I can't do your homework for you, right? We stood by that story. It took more than a year, and the guy finally confessed on the book. And he returned $9.4 million with it. Uh, so I was off. I thought it was $5 million. He got it because he made more than that. Uh, but you know, we took a lot of heat for that story. But we stood by it because we trusted that our sources were, were good. Um, and sometimes I do get criticized. But more and more, the Union Tribune and other papers have started to, um, to quote us, to refer to our coverage as first reported by the press. And that means a lot to us because it's a validation of what we do, a validation of our work, that Jeff McDonald and other people at the UT are willing to quote us because they're putting their reputations on the line by, by quoting us. So it's an interesting experience. I didn't set out to do this when I bought the press up. I, I bought it to save it. I didn't think I was going to write. And more and more I would go to my reporters and say, you know, you didn't get the whole story. And I would start to fill them in on the story, and then by the end of the story, it was more mine than theirs. And so I had to start putting my name on these stories. And, um, and now I, I write a lot of these stories myself. And sometimes I write it, and you wouldn't believe it. On the side of the road on my phone. I get some idea, and I, I'll pull over, and I'll write it on my phone, I send it to the editor, and then she'll post it. And then uh, I start getting text messages while I'm still driving home. It's a weird experience how social media has changed the landscape. For, for media. Uh, you probably heard that the Union Tribune sold recently. It was kind of a surprise deal. I think they're going to stop printing the daily paper, probably except for the Sunday paper. And more and more social media has been the equalizer. But the second that the UT stops printing the daily paper, we're all equal. And then it's just going to be about content and credibility. And that's what we've been building at La Prensa, it's our content and credibility, so that the day when it's all digital and we're all equal, we can compete. They no longer have the advantage of 100,000 copies on the street every day. Now it's just going to be, who are you willing to follow? And who do you trust? And so it's an interesting time to be involved. I was involved in the internet before this. I didn't put it on there, but even before this, I was involved in the internet when I was, when I was about 18 years old, when people didn't have email. We were doing some really very cutting edge things. And I got to see the development of that. And we used to think back then, someday people are going to get their news on this web, and nobody believed that. And now, this is how everybody gets their news, right? So I, I've lived through some, some pretty interesting evolution of media, and it's funny now to end up being a newspaper owner. When I was 13, I used to deliver the paper on a bike. Uh, before, and so you remember, before the UT merged to be the Union Tribune, the Tribune was the afternoon paper, right? I used to deliver the green masthead in the afternoon after middle school. Uh, never thinking I'd actually own the newspaper. Now I do. So, uh, you know, this is a, a real weird, non direct way to get to, to where I am. Uh, so, and again, if anybody has any questions while I'm doing this, you know, please, uh, this is kind of just off the top of my head. 
Uh, but the thing that I've written lately has been kind of critical about the Democratic Party, and I thought it would be interesting to talk about it here, because I, um, I have an insight into it. Right? I was the chair of the party before Citizens United lawsuit that allowed all this dark money to be flowing different ways. The, the biggest year I had, and, you know, Steve was around back then, the party was, was very small. I think we raised $250,000 when I was chair. It was a, a lot of money to raise to the party. And this year, the reported raising, I have it on here, I think $3.6 million. Uh, the top column B, the first, uh, first column at the bottom, $3.6 million. The San Diego County Democratic Party, they don't raise that money. Uh, they don't raise it the way I used to. I used to call people. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick, a quick side note how desperate we were for money back then. When I was chair of the party, we hired a phone caller. Uh, uh, he was a, a phone dialer. <laughs> Steve laughing. Yeah, you know, Steve Rivera is a, he's a, a, a big guy in the Democratic Party. He and I grew up doing this. There was a guy named Norm who was a very weird guy, just a weird personality, quirky. But he worked, he was a professional fundraiser on the phone. And we hired him from this big uh, firm where he worked and became our in-house phone call. All he would do every afternoon would look up donor lists and randomly call people, Democrats like you guys, and say, hey, I'm going with the Democratic Party, we're raising money, can, you, can we count on you for $50 or $20 or $10? Can we raise money like that? Right? See, every day this guy was on the phone. So I don't have the personality for that. If I run the phone and people hung up on me two or three times, I'd never do it again. This guy would get hung up on and they'd yell at him. Some people would get. And we raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars doing that and little fundraising and stuff. We had to raise the money ourselves, right? This three point six million dollars. This is money that moves through the party. And so what happens nowadays is money goes through the party. The party takes a little cut off the top and then they pass it through and spend it on the credit campaigns. But it's money that before we would have never taken. If you really look at it, this report is, uh, if you look at the title, it says Form 460, page three of 389. That's a 389, this is only for a two month period, December 23, I'm sorry, October 23, December 31. The party moves millions of dollars through the party now. That's actually just used like a funnel. This is a kind of dirty way to put it, right? And there are a lot of interest groups that want to give money to Democrats. They give it through the party, it gets kind of diluted, and then they spend it on campaigns. And so it's hard to track. It's really hard to know that this entity gave money for this campaign. So, but I have some insight into it. So we wrote a story recently, if you haven't seen it, about a, a certain camp, a campaign consultant that works for the party that's been running this, I think it's a sham, I think it's cheating, by sending out mail that isn't paid for yet. They call it debt, right? Well, I've worked on, like I told you, 74 campaigns. I never had a printer send mail without being paid, ever. I used to have a printer call me and say, the truck's loaded, and it's not gonna move until you bring a check. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, there's one consultant who every one of those campaigns has debt. Sometimes for months, sometimes for years after the election. And nobody really looked into it. And I started pulling these 460s, which I myself have filed dozens and dozens of these forms. And I laid them out on my floor, on the whiteboard. I started kind of following the map. And I wrote this big story a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think today, that puts it all together. There are about 500,000 pieces of mail landing in mailboxes that most of it still hasn't been paid for. And it's it's a cheat, and some of it some of it went to the Democratic Party. About two hundred thousand dollars of it is still owed today. Two hundred thirty, I think, or two hundred twenty-two thousand dollars, something like that, is still owed for over a year ago. And the party hasn't paid it off because it goes through one consultant. So I'm very critical of that. I I believe I did a podcast about a month ago and I, I explained it this way. I think the voter base is like a jury in court, right? As campaigns, we go out and we make our best case, like lawyers do. And we all want to make our client look the best, right? When I, when I had Lori's campaign, Lori won by 12 points, Lori, 13 points or something against a former member. It's been a few years. It was a huge election for Lori, right? We did commercials with her mom and dad. I mean, we did all kinds of things, right? Our job as a consultant, as a campaign, 
is like a lawyer in court and you try to make your client look the best. But you can't lie, you can't cheat, and you can't try to trick the jury, right? So each side makes their arguments and then the jury goes away to some place you don't see them. They make a decision, they come back, and then we all have to live with the consequences of the decision, right? We, we don't always like it. I had four elections, I wish I would have won all of my elections, but I didn't. I had good candidates lose, I had less than, less than perfect candidates win sometimes, you never know. But I, I honor the system, I actually believe in the system, right? And so when I see somebody like this consultant, especially because it's a Democrat and it's my own party, cheating and rigging the system, I think it's bad for all of us. It starts to undermine the process. And we see what happens when people still argue over the, the 2020 election. It, it undermines people's credibility in the process. And we have to, be, if we're willing to engage in this, we have to be willing to accept the consequences, even when we don't like them. Because there's always gonna be another election, right? It's not the last election ever. And if you lose, and the next time you work harder, and, and you win, right? But if you start cheating, if we start cheating, our party starts cheating, then we're, we can't go complain about the other people. And so when I was chair of the party, we were the minority party in the county. The Republicans were in charge. When I started in politics, there were hardly any Democrats in office. There were one or two on the city council in San Diego, now there's all nine, right? We had had two, I think two Democratic mayors. I was in Chula Vista, we had one Democrat on the council. And now we live in a world where the mayor, the city attorney, all nine, we had a majority on the, on the county board of supervisors, which was unheard of before. And so Democrats run the county now. Now we should police ourselves, I think. I think if we allow ourselves and our friends to start cheating, then we can't hold other people accountable. And that's what I've been trying to do. And I get criticized a lot. There's some you know, people around here, some people in the room have heard some pretty bad things about me. And they say I'm trying to destroy the party. So that's why I put up at the beginning of this, right, my credentials, just in case anybody doubts my, my credentials, right? I mean, I've, I've bled for the party. I've worked my ass off for the party. I don't want to destroy it. I want to fix it. And as a media, I, when I was chair of the party, maybe my job would have been to clean it up or, or you know, take some action. I don't have any power. I can't do anything with the party. But as a media, what my job is, is to expose things, to put a light on it, and then let the people that are in charge of the party or the enforcement agencies or the prosecutors, it's their job to go clean this stuff up. I, I, I don't have any power to do that, right? So all I do is try to focus a light on it, focus attention on it, and hopefully it gets fixed. So that's why I thought this was an interesting format, to have this conversation, because I don't want people to think that I'm against the party. I, I, I don't usually do interviews. I've done two podcasts, and this is an interesting thing. Because I want people to know where I'm coming from, it isn't personal, it isn't a vendetta. Those are my credentials. I wouldn't have done all that if I was a Republican. And actually, we've had some people that have become Democrats and used to be Republicans who get less criticism than I do, which is amazing to me, right? So, uh, you know, but I don't just focus on this. I, I fly airplanes, I, a lot I was flying this morning. Um, I'm starting to transition over to write about aviation and travel more than politics. And I might transition out of politics. Right? I've been doing this a long time. 34 years is a long time. It's the vast majority of my life has been doing this. And so over the next couple of years, you might see less and less of me around, around town. Uh, but I did want to show you, it is a magic where I find all this stuff, right? If you guys aren't familiar with these websites, most of these articles I write are 100% based on documents that are publicly available. Nobody gave me secret documents. You want to find out about federal candidates? At the FEC website. The state candidates, Secretary of State. The local candidates of registered voters or the, count, the clerks of the cities. It's all there. What I've figured out in doing a couple of these stories, especially the one about the, the party and the politics, is that the way that they've gotten away with this cheat is that they hide it in plain sight. Okay, they file 460s that at, at first glance they look perfectly fine. All the numbers are there and it looks like they add up. And if you don't know what's behind it, then that you wouldn't look any deeper, right? And so let me tell you what one of the, the stories is still coming. So the story we did the other day about the consultant, in every single one of the campaigns touched by this consultant, they didn't disclose the name of the printer that actually printed the materials. Doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Well, it's required under state law. You have to disclose 
all of your vendors down to five hundred dollars. So if if the party pays a consultant and the consultant pays a broker and the broker pays a pays a printer, all that gets disclosed because we need to know where the money went. All of these campaigns stopped at a print broker, who up until a couple weeks ago, even I thought he was actually the printer. Everybody talks about him as his name is Tony Turpin. Said it's a Turpin, Turpin's a printer. So I'm on the phone with him one day challenging him about these things, and he said, I'm not the printer. I've been doing this a long time, and I thought this guy had been a printer for 20 years. I thought he was a printer. No, he's a broker. So then I finally put it together. He's the one that's not reporting the printer. And why would they not report the printer? Well, it turns out they may not be printing all of the material at Union print shops, which for Democrats, that's, that's a bad thing, right? So if they were to disclose where they sent the money, we would all know pretty quickly that they weren't union printers. So what do they do? They disguise it. But if you don't know that and you look at the 460s, they look completely perfect. So you, it, you gotta get one level deeper, two levels deeper. So that's a story of stuff coming out. We haven't played all of that out yet. So those are the kind of stories that I get blamed for doing, but is it my fault, right? When people say I'm trying to destroy the party by reporting the, the stuff. Who's more to blame? The people that did it or the guy who reports it? <laughs> right? You know, it's not my fault. So uh, I, I'm willing to take the criticism. Uh, in my podcast the other day, one of the guys said, you know, people call you a jackass. I said, I may be a jackass, but I can also be right. Those aren't mutually exclusive positions. <laughs> so I'm willing to take the criticism. I'm willing to be called names and show up here. I should not joke with Susan. I said, I'll be here as long as they don't throw things at me. Um, I'm willing to say the things that other people aren't willing to say and take the criticism as long as they don't say that we're wrong, that we lie. And this is the proof I always throw out there every day. I've been the publisher for eight years. I've written hundreds of stories, and some about Democrats, Republicans, the DA, the mayor. I mean, I've written about some big people. We have never had to retract a story. Not once. Nobody has ever demanded that we retract a story. So that's the proof to me that we're not making stuff up or else I'd be sued every day. I'd be retracting stories and apologizing every day. We've never done it. Not yet. And so we're very careful what we publish. By the time we hit send on a story, you should know how serious I take it that that story is true. We've documented it, we have sources, multiple sources. Because I know that the day I make a mistake, they're going to try to discredit everything I've ever written. Every story. They're going to go back to the first story and say, you can't believe anything the Prince ever wrote. And I protect that legacy because, again, it isn't mine. The Munoz, the dad and the son, put out papers for 39 years before I came along. And I feel like it's their legacy. And I'm kind of the caretaker of it. And I don't want to screw it up on my watch because I'm not going to be doing this forever. So I do take this very seriously. It's a lot of work. Um, I've had reporters call me, and Jeff McDonald's become a good friend. They see a story, and I always, if you read my stories, there are documents with highlights. I document it like it's a white paper, because I don't want people to then say it's just me, my own ideas. No, nope. here's a document. You can find it yourself. Go online. I already showed you where to find it. You can double check my work. And so far, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't made a mistake. So, but it takes a long time. This is a lot of work. And the reporters call me sometimes and say, I know how long it must have taken me to do that. So it, it's an interesting work. I, I don't know. I never expected to do it, but I, I don't know what else I'd be doing right now and having more fun. I actually enjoy this a lot uh, because I think it's rewarding. I mean, when I see people react to the story, I think it's worth doing. Did, did anybody have any, any comments or questions so far? I, I'm, I'm saying things that probably you don't hear at a Democratic club, right? I'm not critical of the party. I, I think there are some issues that have to be resolved, and they should look into it. Scrutiny on publicly available documents from the media. Why hasn't more? I will say. You only criticize the media too. I'm gonna have no friends when I get done with this. Yes. The day I sent in the right in that story, but well, actually, I'm sorry. You talk about that. Can you ask a question? Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just asking what do you attribute? 
One, I think the reporters don't understand this stuff. Not their fault. They've never been on this side of the ledger, right? And it, it really, unless you've seen it, unless you've been there. Look, I used to be in the room when we would say, what are we going to tell the press? I mean, that tells you that the press doesn't know everything, right? They're looking through a window with the curtains drawn. It's really hard. Now I understand it being on the outside. They don't tell us. You know, staffers don't want to confess things. Politicians don't want to confess things. So sometimes we're just like, I have four kids, I always say it's like putting together Legos in a dark room, right? You're feeling around for pieces and then trying to put them together and then try to see what it is, right? It's really hard. So I think one is the reporters don't know what they don't know. The second part is, I think the reporters are, are they want to be friends with the politicians. And, and I, I tell you because I, I say it's like high school. The reporters are like, the band, not the band nerds. And the politicians are like the football jocks. And the only way that the reporters have a relationship is because of reporters. They wouldn't be, in the, wouldn't be invited to the parties. And they love that access. And they love being able to call them and get their phone calls returned. They're impressed by them, I think is the best way to put it. I'm not impressed by them. I've already known them. And I don't want to go to the parties anymore. Right? So I'm willing to challenge them because I don't care what they think about it about what I write. And so it's like Todd Gloria, a good example. He's a few years younger than, than I am. I met him when he was a volunteer on the Susan Davis campaign where I was running the ground operation. And no offense to him, I think he's, he's, he's done a great job doing what he does. But we used to send him out to pick up the donuts and the, and the bagels before we had a young, a young intern, right? I've known him a long time. I write some very critical things about him. He won't talk to me anymore. His office won't engage with me. They don't return our phone calls. And they still write stories, right? Most reporters wouldn't want to have that confrontational relationship with, with the mayor's office, right? It, that's the job. And so I, I think it is two things. I think one, they don't know what they don't know, and two is they're not willing to do it. I've lost a lot of friends because I write things about people that are friends of the mayor's. Uh, so it, it's a tough job. You gotta have, have thick skin. You gotta be willing to, to lose friends and. And the only thing I have to stand on is our credibility. Um, so it, it's, that, that's the best answer I can give you. I don't know, I'm not in their heads. But what I've seen, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I figured it out. You gotta be willing to write these stories. Anybody else? Oh, great people. I'm not trying to talk anymore because he doesn't appreciate criticism really. Um, my question to you is that I think there would be a lot to be learned from getting the, the elected officials, the mayor, for instance, their, their daily calendar, their daily agenda. Who are they meeting with? Because I feel like I used to think that all the Republicans are in bed with the developers. And now everybody's in bed with the developers. And if we don't see that, we don't, we don't have an opportunity to see the lobbyists and the lobbying firms that I know very well from having been doing this for a long time, um, we don't seem to be with them. And it's certainly not us, you know, community and neighborhood groups and democratic clubs that are meeting with them. I think that, uh, is there any way at all to get, to put pressure to have them publish their daily calendar? That would be great, but there are two different ways. It's really hard to get their calendar because there is, some of it is exempt from disclosure because they're personal. So you can't rely on that. But there are lobbying disclosures where they have to disclose that. But the, the way I track it is track the money. Look at the four seats and look who gives money to them. And I wrote a piece about two months ago, I took a lot of criticism for. The headline was, Dem on Dem Political Violence Increasing. And it's what we've seen, and one of the things I want to talk about today too, is what you see in these primaries now, where they're Democrats on Democrats, because Republicans have pretty much disappeared. Right? These races are pretty much all Democratic district. And so what you see now is the labor groups and the Democrats and the business lining up on different sides. And friends having to pick, this is a civil war, right? Families picking different sides. But you look at where the money's coming from. There are certain types of candidates that get developer money. And it's not the candidate's fault. What happens is the developers, the business groups, 
They used to openly give to Republicans. That was, and it was open, everybody knew that. The AGCs, the uh, Association of General Contractors, the BIA, the Building Industry Association, everybody knew that they were the Republican guys, right? Well, now there are no Republicans left. Well, they're still gonna get money. They still have interest. And so they wanna give it to the more friendly Democrat. But they know that they can't give it directly because it'll damage that Democrat among their Democratic friends. So what do they do? They put it through these obscure third-party committees, or they wash it through the party. Look at that disclosure. The, go online look at the party's disclosure. Who are you going to see on there? The AGC, the BIA, some of the biggest Republican business groups in town give to the Democratic Party. Why? Could all of a sudden like the Democratic principles? No, because they're being the endorsed candidate that is the one that they prefer. And so I saw the sign here from Monica Montgomery. This is a great race. I, I wrote about it. That some of the hit pieces that came out against uh, Monica. Two Democrats in that, and you saw where the developers lined up. Yes. And, and, and Janessa Goldbeck got a lot of support. There were a lot of hit pieces that were done by a group funded by Steve Cushman, one of the biggest Republican guys in town. And Monica still survived. And now all those people are coming back. Scott Peters, Juan Vargas, uh, Mike Levin, we're all with Janessa. Now they're all coming back, right? And so that is a function of who's talking to them. The developers didn't go away. They're just picking different horses now. Um, so the, the way to know is look, follow the money. Best answer. There was someone else over here. That, one up here in the middle. <coughs> districts where it's Democratic leaning by, I forget what the D4 race is, it's plus Democratic 30% or something like that, it's a huge Democratic district. You can win it by only talking to Democrats. So these interest groups, the developers, the, the business guys, can give to the party a bunch of money, spend a bunch of money on government communication, and then the other IEs only spend a little bit of money going after independents and some Republicans. But because the Republican number is so big in these districts, you can put most of the money through the party. That's how $3.6 million comes together. And it, I encourage you, go look at the disclosure and see who's giving big checks to the party. It's not, these don't only be labor groups. And those are our friends, okay. But when you start seeing the labor groups give and the other side, the business guys, how are those, those two people should never be in the same place at the same time. They are because they're picking between what I call Blue Democrats and kind of purple Democrats. There's shades of blue now. When before it was really easy, right? Where were the Republicans and then with the Democrats? It's not that easy anymore. So, now it's, so my piece was called Dem on Dem Violence because we see this. We saw it in, in the race in the special election with um, David Alvarez and Jorge Gomez, right? Um, Akila Weber and Leticia, um, Monica and, and, uh, and Janessa. I think we're going to see more and more of these Democratic fights. The Republicans just aren't around anymore. Uh, so, uh, um, I'm glad you that we have two candidates in the short list of uh, city uh, council, priests, and revenues. Right. Um, I'm going to have a second minister. Oh, right, okay. Um, <coughs> and, um, Hey everyone, my name is Mark Stoichis, I'm on the City Council of Fashion City. I think there's a lot of good evidence or just appreciate you welcome here. So I'm just trying to hear this slowly. So yeah, I just uh, appreciate the welcome. And I wanted to give a shout out to Art and to thank you publicly because um, I went for uh, maybe some of the things to tell a story that Art did. Um, about uh, the consultants, about us who uh, were paid by the party to support me, and at the same time, we 
or exactly, at least this is what all the evidence shows, like I showed. And uh, for a couple of years, I've asked my friends, asked people in the party to look into it, to investigate it, and I was actively discouraged from doing so. And it's, you know, I'm told that I should be afraid that I'd be tied in the case. Um, so, but once I did get the evidence, um, it's um, art has been the only one, uh, more so than some of my friends, and more so, unfortunately, than my own party to, to actually look into who was happening. So, I do want to share my heart. Thank you. Thank you. So now people are saying that Marcus controls me. He tells me what to write. Before, before today, this is the second time I've ever seen Marcus in person in my life. Right? Marcus. So, you know, I, I don't write about things because he's a friend of mine or an ally or I'm protecting him. I wrote a story that was based on the truth, on something that I thought was wrong, that we can prove was wrong. Marcus couldn't prove it himself. The party didn't admit it. And I ended up having just coincidentally some relationships that they were proved what Marcus didn't know. Marcus was victimized. And they make him feel guilty now for bringing it up. And so I, I've told him a couple times before, if you're the victim, other people should be embarrassed by what they did. But we need to hold our friends accountable. That's what I said earlier. I, I don't know if you were here but when I said that, Marcus said, you know, we need to hold our folks accountable. Because if we don't, then we're just as bad and we're complicit in what's going on. And so it's gotta be fair, like I said before. The process has to be fair. We can't criticize the Republicans or Trump or January 6th or whatever if we're going to be complicit in the same type of behavior. Um, so that, that's what this is about. Um, I hope that people understand that, and I hope that we all hold each other accountable. And if I screw up, I expect all of you and all my friends to call me and say, that was stupid. What a stupid thing to do. Um, because none, none of us are perfect. There was something else.
So we're looking, at, yeah, we're looking at that. You know, I always contact everybody when I'm doing a story. I always want to give every, each side, or everybody involved, an opportunity to comment, not just because stories should have both sides. I don't think that's what makes a story good. I always call the subjects because I want them to be able to have an opportunity to tell me if I'm wrong before the story goes out. <laughs> tell me. So when I call, I always say, I tell them, look, this is what I found. Help me understand why it isn't as bad as it looks. Because this looks really bad. And usually they don't call us, and so we run with the story. And so when we did the story about the party and the debt, we contacted the party by text, by email, individuals saying, can you guys, can somebody help me explain this? Their best response was, kind of reminiscent of Donald Trump. We're in an audit right now, so we can't come. Okay? I ask the question like, do you think it's legal and proper to not pay for pieces? And I don't think that is an answer that needs an audit, right? So their answer to me, and we put it in the article, was they're under an audit. You find out the other day that the party can't find an auditor willing to audit their books. They're not going through an audit, they're trying to find an auditor, right? And so Lori did this research, there is no audit committee. There is no standard process for annual audits like a company would have. And so what happens when, when somebody believes that nobody's looking? It's just human nature to get away with other things, to be a little less proper, right? To be a little less formal. And so $3.6 million this year, it was about as much the year before. They've raised almost a million dollars so far this year. There are no audits of where that money came in and where that money went. So it's not surprising that they owe two hundred forty some thousand dollars, all of it for mail that went out last year. Had I not written that story, it would still be an inside secret. People at the party knew. It's not a secret to the executive director and to the executive committee, but they weren't saying anything. And when I call, the best thing they could come up with was we're in an audit, which ended up being not true. So. I think we're on, we're on to something, and, then, and I, again, we need to hold them accountable. We need to fix it. I, I keep saying it's like having a tumorous cancer. I just put an X on it. If you don't cut it out, you're going to die. So you know, I can't cut it out, but if the party doesn't heal itself, there, I think there's going to be some problems. You know, down the road. Somebody else will be on the table. First of all, I want to thank you for being here. I think it's really important that we stand this. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is the treatment of young people in our party. Um, I have had many opportunities to be a leader in this party, um, although there's been many times where, you know, one of the first days I entered the party, I was called out uh, in the central committee meeting and said, uh, the then chair was like, are you even a Republican? So I walked out of the room. There's been many circumstances like that, and you know, constantly, you know, I'm getting attacked now for my affiliations and then things like that. So, you know, I wanted to see what's your experience when you were chair, you know, throughout this whole process of how you treat young folks in the party. We talk about inclusion, diversity, equity, but do we practice? Do we practice that? No, I, that's a good question. I can't speak to the party now because I have literally 20. Three years probably haven't been to a single Democratic meeting. But when I was chair, I was 26 years old, right? younger than you are right now. So I was given, I went to every Democratic club. I came to this one back then. So this was 98 or 99. But by the way, my introduction to being chair, six days after I became chair, Bill Clinton admitted the relationship with Monica Lewinsky. So my first press interviews were, How do you feel to be a Democrat? Or, you know, after that. So, it was rough, but I went to every, I made the rounds to every single Democratic club. And I was at a Democratic club in this, I think it was. And I thought I was, I thought I knew what I was doing. 26 years old, I gave a speech about what I was doing. And a guy in the back had to be at least 80. Raised his hand, he says, I just gotta ask you, how old are you? And if you can imagine, right? People think I'm younger than I am. When I was 26, I looked like I was 12. And I said, I was all cross, I'm 26. And from the back, he said, another guy says, I have socks older than that. So that was, the, that was the welcome to the chair of the Democratic Party. It's always been difficult because people, you know, they assume you don't have enough experience or you just haven't been around long enough, which is why I still put my resume up to show, right? Um, but there's got to be a mix. I mean, there's got to be a, a next generation. And I always tell people, I gave a, a presentation one time and I put up a slide. People always talk about passing the baton, right? Passing the baton. That's kind of a generic statement. 
Well, I ran track very competitively in high school and my first two years of college. And I was a pretty fast uh, a relay runner. And I was always the last relay, the last leg. Sometimes 4x100, sometimes 4x400. On the 4x100, and this is what I always tell people, that they're not just passing to the top. That just means you give it to the next person, right? But if any of you have ever seen a track race or been in a track runner, when you run a, a short distance, a 4x100, there's a very short piece of track where the, where the transition has to happen. You can't just pass it anywhere, right? And so what you do is you wait for the other runner and you practice this. And when they're at a certain point, I start to run. And during that, that piece where it's a, the transition period, I have to get up to full speed and I put my hand back and the other person is running fast as they can and they put it to my hand and you smoothly transition and keep running. You don't transition it at, from a stand, standing still, right? And I always show that analogy because in order for the baton to be passed, the receiving person has to be ready for it. And so what I always tell people is, yeah, we need to encourage young people to be there so that they're ready so by the time that the older person is passing the baton, we're in sync. They're finishing the race and the next person is about to take off, right? And so it, I've always thought that you know we should encourage people to come in, we should train them, we should encourage them, mentor them so that they are ready, so that they're not just fresh. Because we, we don't want to give the baton to someone who has no experience. And so I think it's a combination. I think the, the young person has to be ready for it, but as older people now I'm, I'm there, we have to be willing to get them ready and to pass the baton at the right time so that they can take off. Does that make sense, right? Uh, but yeah, you, you look around and sometimes the Democratic Party uh, doesn't reflect the, the demographics of the voter base. And it, it works on, you know, both sides have to be willing to do that. Yeah. But thanks for doing what you do. He's the president of the downtown, right? President of the downtown. <laughs> Our two quick questions for you. First of all, when you were uh, on staff, uh, Senate, State Senate, who were you on staff with? The whole time I worked for legislators, 13 and a half years, I worked for one member, a guy named Steve Peace. Oh. So, so Steve was in the legislature for 20 years. I worked for him 13 and a half of those 20. I went from an office intern to the chief of staff in the same office. Second question, real quick. When are you going to run? <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never. <laughs> You know, it's funny that everything I've ever done, people always assumed I was doing it to run. So when I became chair of the party, I'd already been in politics for a while. Everybody was sure that that was my step to run, right? And then I did something else after that and thought I was ready. When I bought the paper, I had never been a journalist. I didn't study journalism. Even reporters thought it was, it was an agenda, or right? I was going to promote myself, God forbid, to run for office, right? I've been doing this 34 years now. The last thing on my mind is that we're going for I'm, I'm on the downside of the curve now. <laughs> like I tell you, I, I, on the day like this, I, I woke up this morning, so I fly airplanes for fun, but I'm training for a big trip. And I woke up this morning in horrible weather, and I called the airport, and they said, no, it, it doesn't look like it's going to clear, it's going to rain tonight. At about 11 o'clock, it got clear. I ran down to the airport, I went flying for a while. I, I got here, I went home, showered, and came down to fly. Or came down to <laughs> I'd rather be flying, even than doing I love politics. I got to tell you, the truth is, on election day now, I had like withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> because that was my that was my Super Bowl, right? All the stuff you worked up to is election day. I don't have anything to do on election day anymore. I wrote my story about it before the election. And I have to wait till eight o'clock for the first results to come in. And it, it kills me. And, but you know, I have already done it. It's time for people like Danny and other people to to, to take it up. Um, you know, the long version of the short answer. Never, never. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate your presentation. Um, but with regards to Monica and the recent days of hers, um, there were some mailers that came out from the last cycle um, with regards to her being depicted and just not in a great light. And um, here in the cell, we actually had a conversation with some of the leadership regarding that. Is what you kind of reported on with the, the mailers? Is there an opportunity for Democrats to even be uh, supporting the police officer association or, you know, in Iraq? Is that still going on within our party? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I wrote a, a very critical piece about those hit pieces. If you guys, you guys didn't see them, um, they were for Janessa against Monica. 
And they did the old, you know, racial trope of a nice color picture of one person and a grainy black and white picture of the African American candidate. It was, it was horrible, right? And it was done by an outside group, um, the, the, basically the Police Officers Association. The, the consultant for the POA, someone I've known for a long time, he's a Latino Democrat, he did those pieces. And I called him up, I said, this is horrible. Not, not only do I not think they're very good for you, but the police used to only do positive campaigns. Back 20 years ago, if you got the endorsement of the POA for a local race, or the DSA, the Deputy Sheriff's Association, for a county race, that was it, you would win the race. And, it would, and you, would, you could hide behind the badge. Right? They would put out these signs say, law enforcement's choice, they do yard signs, they do signs on black posts everywhere. Because their image has now been damaged, right? The police are not the endorsement they used to be. They've now resorted to attacks, to negative hits. So I did a piece saying that they were not only racist and untrue because they painted her as a defunder when she actually voted for every single budget that came in front of her, but they, they damaged the police officers' union's own reputation. And so your question is, can we support them? I think there's going to be some, some, some very tough conversations among Democrats and police and Democrats who support police. Let's talk about Todd Glory, for example. It's very unusual to have a new mayor come in who is so different in politics from the old mayor and keep the same police chief. That's usually the first person they get rid of, right? If you go to the chief, say, chief, sorry, but we need to appear to have a new approach. Same chief, same tactics. Todd has become Faulkner 2.0 as far as homelessness, enforcement, you know, uh, law enforcement, uh, criminal justice reform. I, and I'm not bragging about being on the right, but go back to my 2020 uh, endorsement. We didn't endorse Todd Lord. And I took a lot of heat for that because he's the mixed race Democrat. And we endorsed Barbara Reed. And I didn't know Barbara Reed very well before that. But I wrote to be saying Todd is going to be exactly the insider because to your question, how did I know that? Look at his 460s. Everybody who would give to, to Faulkner gave to Todd Lord. And all I had to know was, you can't be an agent of change when all the agents of the system are giving you the money. That's exactly what's come to pass, right? So I think there has to be a reckoning. The, the cops have to be more accepting of what the perception is. But if you notice, from where we were, uh, George Floyd time to now, the pendulum has swung back, right? It was defund police, criminal justice reform, and now the Democrats, like Todd, have become tough on crime and you know prosecuting people for being homeless, right? Because the electorate in general has moved back to the middle. Everybody was sympathetic, and all of a sudden they 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 come back. And you look at the polling that they're doing. Todd Gloria is only reflecting the polling that he sees. That's where the public is. That's where he's going. Uh, but we have not gotten to the bottom of this, and I think that the, the relationship with the police is still damaged, uh, especially among Democrats. And so you see the POA, um, the LA, they call it the police, I don't call it POA, but they're basically their POA union gives a lot of money to people in San Diego through the Deputy Sheriff Association, through the, um, the San Diego POA. Uh, so, but again, follow the money. 460s are all online, you can see who's who. Can you do one more question? Yeah, one more question. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, okay, let's see. <laughs> you did? Good. There we go. We're on the same. Um, some of the older right, actually used to staff for the um, I'm sorry, for, with, with, with Michael Ford too? Yes. Oh, he was a good friend of mine. Always in a little bit of a hard with the community, which that kind of resonates a little bit with what's going on here, because people would come to them and say, hey, why are you writing these stories on our community, on our organizations? And he would constantly say, well, first of all, his favorite uh, phrase was, who shall stand guard against the guards themselves? Uh, you might know that one. Uh, and he would say, listen, if we cannot police our own community, we cannot critique and correct the mistakes that we are making. Just wait till we get the hands of our adversaries. They will do much better than we will. Um, so I just want to kind of throw that out there. You know, we, 
we sometimes lose sight of the long view of things and how things have evolved over time. We used to be the Democrats, uh, Michael was uh, very active at work in the minority. And now we have the power, and you know, we find ourselves in the situation of a king, as you just alluded to, you know, a Kevin Faulkner 2.0. Uh, how did this happen? How is it that these interests have plugged into our party and co opted upon us? And that's exactly what I have. So, what was your first name? Tim. Tim. Uh, it's funny you said that. Uh, you talked about Michael Portantino, who used to be the owner and publisher of the San Diego Gay Lesbian Times. Um, and I thought about it maybe, Eric, because when Feinstein passed away, mm -hmm. we did a fundraiser when I was chair at Michael's house oh, yeah. with Diane Feinstein, and I introduced her. We have a great picture together with Michael. I just saw that the other day. Uh, he passed away, passed away a few years ago, but, but let me tell you a quick story about that, because Michael was stood his ground. Yeah. One of the things I didn't put up here is why I left being chair. And Steve was there, so he can, he can validate, you know what I'm saying? I was chair of the party, 26 years old, big, you know, takeover. And going into the 20, the, what year? Yeah, 20, so the, the 2002 election. So in 2001, Bonnie Dumanis was running for DA, first time. The Democrat challenger in her was Mike Aguirre, who later became city attorney. Mike was running, Mike scored 100% on our questionnaire, went to all the clubs. He went to the San Diego Dem Club, which was now changed name, right, but it's a gay community club in El Crescent, uh, the Equality, right? It used to be the San Diego Dem Club. Mike scored 100%. They endorsed Bonnie Dumanis, a Republican, and so I called the, the president of the club privately and went to coffee and I said, look, you can't endorse a Republican. That's antithetical to what we do. We're the Democratic Party, right? So you know what the response was? I must be a homophobe. I, they called me a homophobe because I told them they couldn't endorse a Republican. It turned into a big public fight. Right? Steve, Steve lived through this. Went to the state Democratic uh, the Rules Committee, the state party, and they told the club that if they didn't rescind the endorsement, they would be un, you know, dischartered, or they, they revoked the charter. So they backed down, they rated Bonnie acceptable, didn't rate Mike. Mike lost by two points in that race, and we ended up with Bonnie Dumanis for eight years, who then handed off to Summer stuff, right? So, elections have consequences, right? I was criticized because I stood up to people saying, this isn't right. It's so wrong that now the bylaws of the Central Committee say you cannot endorse Republicans. <laughs> uh, it had to take a bylaw change. I mean, we didn't figure that out or something. Michael Portantino wrote two articles defending me when everybody turned against me. And so it was a, the San Diego Gay Lesbian Times publisher wrote a piece saying I was right. This is what they're doing is wrong. He held them accountable. Uh, so Michael was great. I, I never thought I'd be a publisher like him. I, I missed him. My first interview. Oh, there you go. Okay, that was the same time. So anyway, so yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, not a lot of people that have a platform like I do, like Michael did, are willing to stand up because you don't want to take criticism and lose advertisers and lose friends. Yeah. Um, but we have to stand up for a friend. This is the, I saw the, I didn't have my mic, the flyers for the person who can't make money and so on, and I got them, and I was like, they were so horrifying. And they remind me of other flyers that I got in, in earlier elections. They weren't equally matching. How could this be that a Democrat said that's a whore card? Because they're very expensive. How could this be? So, in what you turned over, have you seen that there are earlier or more historic or a long history of such? Yeah. Awful Actually, you know, Marcus is the one who's now been putting together. It's happened in multiple races. This is what happened to him three years ago, right? They, they did these hit pieces and made him look like a criminal. Um, they were misleading at best. And luckily, he still won, right? But he was still a victim, even though he, he won a race where the National City they run at large, the multiple candidates running for for two of the seats. Um, and there was another Democrat in the race and they only attacked one versus the other. We've seen it in uh, the Aquila Weber race 
uh, special election that she won, David Alvarez. Uh, there are several, and unfortunately, it's been the black community who's been the victim of that. And we need to talk about that. And we're the Democratic Party. We're supposed to be the big tech party. And here we are having these internal fights, these civil wars, and it usually comes down to racial lines. Um, it, it's really unfortunate. And so, but it takes good people to speak up and say, we shouldn't tolerate this stuff. But it, that was not a nice event case. That's what made it so bad that we, we know better. You know? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for the presentation and for taking so many of the club's questions. We're so lucky to have you here. Thank you, Lori, for the introduction as well. Um, we'll continue with the meeting. Um, we'll have officer reports, um, announcements from elected officials and candidates, and some open forum for announcements as well. We'll start with officer reports. Um, I'll start with the president's report and ask, please save the date for December 10th. That's going to be our holiday party. We'll have a toy drive component, hopefully announcing some um, great guests as well, so please uh, save the date. Um, we don't have minutes to present at this meeting. Um, Angela, our treasurer, do you have anything to present today? Right on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So our club um, has had a benefit from the um, fact that we ended up having to be online for many years, and as a result, we have built up a nice um, $9,800 in our checking account. Um, we will soon, though, be paying rent again um, here at this place, so um, it will, we will have expenditures in the upcoming years that will reduce this. Um, plus, we have 2024 coming up, where hopefully we will be doing some endorsements and supporting candidates um, as we go forward. Our membership right now is 112 um, members. We will hope to increase the membership in 2024 as we get geared up for the election. I do want to remind everybody that the way our club works is that dues are due on January 1st. So we don't have any rotating membership. Fundamentally, all dues are due on January 1st. By January 31st, if you haven't renewed, you can't vote in our endorsement discussions, so just make sure that you endorse, I mean, that, sorry that you renew by January 31st. There will be emails going out to remind everyone. Um, if you choose to renew early, um, anytime after November 1st, your renewal goes through all of 2024. Um, and lastly, I am actually the person coordinating the grassroots organizing team for um, our area that will come up with the canvassing that takes place. Um, I realize we've had quite a conversation about the San Diego County Democratic Party today, but fundamentally we do need to get Democrats out to vote. And if anyone wants to um, volunteer for canvassing, will you please let me know and I'll get you signed up for um, trainings that will be taking place soon and help with canvassing to get out Democratic voters um, in the 2024 election year. Thank you, Angela, and uh, hope some of you consider signing up. Um, we will open up for electeds and candidates. Um, if you are an elected official or a candidate, we will give you two minutes to speak, starting with Sonara. Want to come on up? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sonara Velasquez, and I'm director of clubs for the San Diego County Democratic Party. And I'm talking to you today as director of clubs because a lot of what uh, Art was talking about, which is who has the voice, who has the influence in the San Diego County Democratic Party. And me, my job, Director of Clubs, is to advocate for clubs. I want our voice, the voice of the communities that the Democratic Party serves, to be heard in our party. And one way we do that is through our seats on the Central Committee. Each club gets one seat by default on the Central Committee, one seat only for their vote. And then a lot of other seats, 40 in fact, are done via election on the public ballot. So how could I get a bigger voice for the clubs in the Democratic Party? By getting the clubs, such as yourself, Point Loma Democratic Club, to get your members elected as elected members of Central Committee. As elected members of Central Committee, your vote is unbound, 
you also have an alternate, and you know your community and you can speak for your community. So I'm here today to encourage everyone to run for Central Committee. We need more grassroots community voices in our Central Committee, so please do so. The treasurer has said that there's $9,000 in the bank. If members of this club are running for Central Committee, just gonna throw this out there, that would be some great candidates to support in 2024. So not do we just get elected officials, we get better endorsed candidates and better future elected officials in the future. Now, I myself am leading by example and running for Central Committee. I brought my nomination forms today. You can pick up your nomination forms today at the San Diego County Registrar of Voters in Kearney Mesa. They are open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. You need to get uh, 20 signatures minimum. You can get up to 40. Get up to 40 because somebody is not going to put their name right. Somebody's going to be illegible. Someone's not going to live in your district. You need to get 40 signatures, well, 20 ballot signatures of people who live in your assembly district and are Democrats. I'm sending my nomination form around here today. I'd love for you all who live in my district. I live here in Ocean Beach, so um, 77th Assembly, if you live there and are a Democrat, please sign it. I need your help to qualify for the ballot, and I want you to qualify for the ballot. You need to have these signatures collected by December 8th. So please go down today, pick up your nomination forms, come to the next meeting of the Point Level Democratic Club, and get 40 of your friends and neighbors, including ourselves, to sign it. Thank you very much. I'm Christine Brady, and this is kind of like coming home. I worked for eight years for NOSC as an engineer, um, top side, bay side, and seaside. And um, I'm running for District 4 of Chula Vista against the infamous consultant's sister. I'm running against Andrea Cardenas. Um, as I said, I was an engineer, and I finished as the director of a $600 million program for the Navy. And then I left the, that work to begin what I thought was going to be social development work and community development work and not engineering, but I found out it was engineering. I built schools in Tijuana and I solved problems, all kinds of problems. And one of the ways I found to solve the problems is by introduce, introducing art and architecture. I don't know if you know James Hubble. I brought him in. We built the world's most beautiful kindergarten, and won the American Institute of Architecture Award. I've also won the United Nations Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award. And I look forward to, I have lived in Chula Vista for 25 years and watched my particular district go downhill, have less services, um, businesses going out of business, and I'm concerned about fiscal responsibility. We have a, a big budget for Chula Vista, $530 million a year, and they had an extra $100 million this year. I don't think they're spending the money to, for the benefit of the people. I originally became interested in becoming a candidate because I wanted to help the homeless, and I have a full plan for the homeless of building them little homes, 650 square feet, 192 around a mental hospital. It's modeled on the, uh, the successful Salt Lake City program for helping the homeless. And you know, I really believe in this, this project. I've been the president of the America's Foundation Fundación de las Americas for 35 years. And that's how I got into building schools and introducing art and culture into the community. Right now I'm on the Commission for Arts and Culture and I'm hoping that we'll see some results from that shortly. And I encourage you all to support my candidacy. It's important, it's right. Um, it's close by and um, contribute financially and and also emotionally to my to my candidacy and thank you for being here and listening to what I have to say. Thank you. and I'm also running for Chula Vista District 4. The reason why I'm here is that I ran against Andrea Cardenas four years ago. 
And, and it was a very hard race. I ran as a candidate because I didn't have a sidewalk on my, on my street. I lived, I lived in that house for 25 years, and my mother was in a wheelchair on dialysis going to Broadway, which is a, a street that's very, uh, very heavily populated, and it tipped over because there was no sidewalk. Due to those injuries, she passed away. And I said, you know what? There needs to be a voice for our community, and that's why I ran. Well, four years ago, it was a horrible race. I can tell you things that happened personally against me, and I can tell you things that happened publicly against me. Being served, a, you know, on Christmas Eve from Andrea Cardenas' team saying, um, here, you're being served, and having to find a lawyer, and to be able to get the consultation, and spend the money instead of on my campaign and on showing the flyers and being able to present myself, I had to be able to go to court and be able to prove who I was, and it was a frivolous lawsuit. And I, obviously I was able to, you know, the judge throw it out. But this is the type of person who she was four years ago. The fight that was so big was because of cannabis four years ago. And now there's a lawsuit because of what she's done. The reason why I'm here today, the reason why I'm, I'm putting my hat back into this race is for a big reason. We have over 2,000 Democrats that have left the Democratic Party in South Bay because of what is going on. 2,000, it's called L-E-X-I-T, Latinos exiting the Democratic Party. This is very concerning. We have lost our mayor race. We have a Republican, which we should have won. We have lost our national city race because we have Democrats fighting against each other. And for this reason, I'm here at this moment, being able to present myself. My name is Delfina Gonzalez. I have been a supporter. I have been active helping our elected officials and our candidates win their races. And I know that at this time and at this moment, we need Democrats to have the courage to stand up and to be able to say enough is enough. We need to be able to be a representation with integrity. And thank you. My name is Alvina, and if you have any questions, meet me. Thank you. My name is Timothy Bailash, and I apologize to the club I was in Valley Center. My car broke down Friday at eight hours, so my transportation is limited. I am a candidate in the Congressional Race 50 for California. My name is Timothy Bailash. I am a lifelong board-certified obstetrician gynecologist. I am a graduate scientist. I have cards. You could go to my website if you want to learn more about me. Some of you may have seen me before. I go to a lot of the clubs. Um, I just wanted to mention I'm collecting some signatures. I need 19 more to get on the ballot in the 50th. I know many are uh, beholden to the current office holder. I called the district for him even when he wasn't in my district 10 years ago. So just wanted to let you know. Thank you for the time. I apologize for taking that. If you're interested, I'm not going to congressional district. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that I am a club member and I do plan on, um, I just picked up my paperwork on Friday from the Register of Voters myself. So I will be a candidate as well for the Southern Southern District for Central Committee. So uh, before you leave, I would appreciate your signature as well so that I can get my signatures to get on the ballot before the deadline. Thank you. Just want to be close today. We'll open it up for Oak Creek. Yeah. Okay. I think this was the first club I announced that when I decided to run. So um, I'm back at you again. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm tired of the status quo. I'm really tired of it. And um, the treatment that I've felt in this Democratic Party has been appalling. So I'm running. I'm not going to shy away, I'm not going to do as though that people said, you know, I'm not going to take my name away, I'm not going to shy away and be quiet. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight. Um, and so I also, you guys have a lot of signatures to fill out today, <laughs> because I would also like your signature to nominate me for the Central Committee for the 77th District. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's it's about damn time that we get some young voters in this party. 
And so that is going to be my number one goal when I get elected to the Central Committee, is bringing in new blood into this community. Uh, we have so much opportunity for young folks to be mentored, to get involved. We have a whole generation of folks to educate about what we, we see here in our politics today. And so I am uh, across all the counties, uh, all the colleges, talking to students on the ground, letting them know that this is what they should be doing, that they should be running, that they should be talking, they should be educating themselves about what's going on in our community. And so I am going to continue to do that. We are building this plate of folks um, that will be on that, um, you know, we will be running together. So I'll be talking to a lot of students at SDSU, UCSD, USD, um, to make sure that these these folks that don't necessarily get outreach to know what the Central Committee is. Most people don't even know what it is. So it's important that I think, I, I think I, you know, I'm very passionate about making sure that um, young folks are educated because, you know, when I was 21, I didn't know what the Central Committee was. I didn't know what the Democratic Party was. <laughs> so uh, now I know what it is. And, you know, after spending some time in, in, in the party, I am ready to, to stand up. I'm ready to be in the fight. Um, you know what they say, it's, it's, you know, you're in the fight, um, and you are going to get hit, you are going to have some, some people tell you some bad things, you are going to lose sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's you being in that fight is what counts. So I, I want to thank you for that. I also have another point, you know, Okay, wonderful. I also want to say I also run as a, uh, a campaign manager for different campaigns. And um, I represent Colleen Cusack, who is going to be running for San Diego um, District 3, which is going to be defeating Stephen Whipper. We've seen all the cronyism that's going on with his office. We've seen the Carbon must take over. He was his chief of staff. Um, we've seen so many disgusting things at the city council, where I've also had enough at the city council. I'm going to make sure that Colleen Cusack is uh, elected to the city council because not only is she a trial attorney that's been representing our homeless folks for over 10 years now for free, she's also been helping to fight for rental protection, she's also been helping to fight for making sure that we have transparency in government, and she is the person that knows on the street what homeless people need. The biggest crisis facing District 3 is going to be homelessness, and I think she's the expert that we need at this time. And so I think, you know, a lot of the communities have been saying that, you know, we're sick and tired, you know, we want some change. This is the opportunity to do it. So I would, I would urge this club to take it up for consideration uh, for District 3 if possible. Thank you. Okay, anyone else, I see Lori, anyone else um, yeah. candidate announcements? Okay, then we'll end with Lori. Thank you. So, uh, I am also running for Central Committee. I'm on the Central Committee now, but I am in the 78th Assembly District. The previous speakers are in the 77th, so please do sign their nomination papers. And if you do live in Chris Ward's district, then that's the district I'm running for. Um, I was so happy that Art gave his presentation today because over a year ago I started asking questions about the budget for the county party. And the response that I received has made me, made me realize a year and a half ago there are some problems here and they don't want to answer the questions. So I'm really pleased that Art is doing the research and, and finding out more about this. Um, one other thing, um, he mentioned the ads, a few of you mentioned the ads against Monica Montgomery is looking like Monica is going to be our next county supervisor. Um, a few months ago in July, I asked a question about those ads of a congressional representative who was here that day who had endorsed another candidate. Um, then I posted on social media about what he had said. Well, he and his staff filed a formal ethics complaint against me. And they based that on recording your meeting, which is a violation of your bylaws. <laughs> And that ethics complaint is continuing, months and months are going on, and it's still in process. And I wanted to ask at some point if this club could simply send a letter to the ethics committee that they should not be basing a complaint on a violation of this club's policies, procedures, and bylaws. They claimed I misquoted Scott Peters because I summarized his statement and what I posted on social media was not that different from what he had said verbatim. But it is, it is a drain on me, 
and I would really appreciate if the club could simply say, please drop this ethics complaint. And the e-board of the club is aware of some of the details of this. And so at the next meeting, if this hasn't been resolved, I'd really appreciate if the club could, on, on behalf of your, I'm a member, I've been a member a long time of the club, please say, um, just drop this ethics investigation because the whole purpose is frankly to get me to be kicked out of the Central Committee. They don't like me, as Art was saying, and others have said, they don't like people who ask questions. And so um, I'm running for re-election. If you do live in Chris Ward's Assembly District, I'll ask you to sign the documents. But more importantly, I think the club really needs to say, um, you shouldn't be kicking people out for asking tough questions, whether it's here at your club meeting or as being a member of the Central Committee. Thank you. Thank you to all our candidates who are here today and who spoke. Um, we have a time for a few announcements. Um, if anyone wants to take a couple minutes to announce any events in the community, don't see any hand raised. Um, I do see Ruth, who's going to be our last announcement before we adjourn today. This is just sort of an FYI. We have Sonara over here, who's a member of our club. And she is the director of clubs. Now, in the past, I served four years as director of clubs. And then the next four years, it was John Laughlin. And then for a couple of years, we had a gal that worked for Scott Peters. And now, we have Sonata. So I want you to know that you belong to a club that has lots of good leaders. And so if you are members, you're part of that. Be good leaders. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I go to a lot of club meetings. I've seen a lot of people. I've been in San Diego for 15 years. I have great concerns about what has happened in the San Diego Democratic Party and the Democrat. I just want Sonara to know what a super job you're doing. And she is everywhere. And if you haven't talked to her, you should. And she's trying to bring the clubs together by being there, not just in one club. And so thank you. I just want to get that public. Thank you, Mr. Sonara. Thank you, Ruth. Our last announcement is going to be from Susan. Um, I'm just going to let, let everyone know that we are going to um, start the custom again that we had before uh, the uh, pandemic started, we will be going to the point break afterwards for a more discussion. And, and Art has agreed to, to join us. So the point break is on Shelter Island. It's first run. So come join us. It's a dive, but we love that. <laughs> Perfect. And on that note, we'll adjourn at 5.30. Thank you for everyone being here. And I guess see some of you down the street. Thanks. Thanks.